Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's service. And welcome to any visitors on this cold autumn morning. After the service, there's a warm cup of tea in the hall, and visitors can follow around uh, the side of the church to the hall behind us here. And as you walk around, you can enjoy the gardens around the church. The lavender and the pomegranates give us some nice autumn colour at the moment. So our session Kark is at Western Creek this morning for the dedication service there. I'll just uh, remind um, families that children and young people will go out to the Sunday school after their hymn. And tonight, Nathan will be leading our church at five service in the church here. Thank you. As we come together for this time of worship, we celebrate the ascension of Christ. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us come boldly onto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you today as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We bring you our praise, we offer you our homage, we dedicate our lives to your service. Blessing and honor and glory and might are yours, O Lord, this day and forevermore. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, we remember on this Sunday after the ascension how your apostles stood gazing into heaven, troubled and confused, fearing they had lost you, struggling to make sense of their experience. We remember how in the days following your ascension they remained hidden behind locked doors, bound by the weakness of their imagination, tied down by the feebleness of their vision, restricted by the smallness of their faith. Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us that all too often we make the same mistake as the apostles did. We expect you to fit in with our own expectations. We assume that we know all there is to know about you. We settle for a comfortable, cozy picture of you that offers much and asks little. And when that way of thinking is challenged or threatened, we are puzzled, suddenly overcome by a multitude of questions. Forgive us that our horizons have been too narrow, our sights set too low, our expectations too limited. Help us on this Ascension Sunday to glimpse the wonder of who you are and the untold possibilities of all you can do, catching our breath in awe and captured by a new vision of your kingdom. Open our eyes to your glory, for we ask it in your name. Amen. We are reminded on this Ascension Sunday that we have been clothed with power from on high. We have the assurance that our sins have been forgiven. Boys and girls, please come to the front for your talk. Not so many today, it would appear. Where are they all? Maybe it's the cold weather well, kept them away. Hope not, because there'll be a few more to go before the year's out. Anyway, good to see you all. Nice to have you in church this morning. Now, I have an object with me this morning, or maybe objects. No, well, that wasn't what I was thinking of just for the congregation's benefit. She's wearing lovely fluffy shoes. Good. Well, that's great. Well, I'm a bit nervous about this object because if it goes badly wrong, uh, then I could be in big trouble. So, in order for it to go right, I need your help. And you cannot afford to make any mistake. So, i tell you what you do. Why don't you all come with me now for a walk, and we'll bring the object in, well, together? Let's see. You coming with me? Right, let's go. All right. I want to hold it. You want to hold it? Well, I'll hold it to you. You walk on in there. Go on in. Go on back into church, back into your usual. All right. <laughs> Keep walking. Here we come. It's like a procession. Now, what is this? Balloons. Go back to your um, usual spot. 
Why do you think I brought these balloons in today? Well, before we talk about the real significance, what I want you to do is, I want you to see if you can keep these balloons on the floor. Well, I'll explain that in a little minute. Right, who's going to help me keep these? Right, try and keep your hands. Don't burst them, whatever you do. Right, I'll tell you what you do now. Let, let go. Let the balloons go. All right, let go. Right, what's happening to them? Why will these balloons not stay on the floor? Because they're what? They're not a rock. Yeah, they have air. They got there. What kind of air do you think is inside them? I'm very nervous in case I let them go because. Boys and girls, what are we going to do with these balloons? Where are, they, where are these balloons going to end up? Take them home. Take them home. Uh, I'm not so sure they're going to get that length. Now, Carolyn, can you come here and just help me a minute? Because I'm getting myself into a bit of a tangle here. Now, can you untangle that a little bit? Is that possible? Let, let go a wee minute. Do you want them all separate? Yes. That's, just let go for a sec. I am so nervous, you wouldn't believe it. Now, what we're, before we do anything else, boys and girls, hold on. What we are going to do is, we're going to go outside. You see that door over here, all right? Well, through that door, there is what we call an outside pulpit. Someday I'm going to preach from it, but that's for another day. All right? We are going to take one each, if we have enough balloons, that is. We're going to go out onto the wayside, or out, wayside, outside pulpit. And what are we going to do then? We are going to let them off, and they'll disappear where? Into the sky. Do you think you'll ever see the balloon again? No. Right. Let's go. Are you sure you won't let it go? Promise me. All right. Go ahead. Sorry. Don't let them go just yet. Go ahead. Right after I say one, after I say three, after I say after three, let the balloons go. One, two, three. Let go. You think you'll ever see them again? Let's go back in. All right, back into church. Come on ahead, back in, back in. Go back to your seat. What was that word you said there? Bye bye. My name is Bye bye. Well, you know, that's exactly 
what Jesus said to his disciples. On that day, when he came to the end of his time in this world, it was time for him to go back to heaven, back to be with his Father, who was God. And he met with his disciples in a quiet place, and what he said to them was this, you have been with me all these years. You realize that I died on the cross for you and for the people in the world. I rose again, and we thought about that on Easter Sunday. And now, having taught you all these things, it's time for me to say goodbye. And so Jesus left them. And just as we said goodbye to the balloons, and as we witnessed them going right up into the sky, right up into the clouds, wherever they will end up, so Jesus disappeared from the midst of the disciples, and He went back to His Father in heaven. But He promised that He would send His Spirit, that He would come in a different form. And that's what we will be thinking about next week when we come to Pentecost and we remember the Holy Spirit coming into this world. But for today, let's give thanks for Jesus that He died for us, that He rose again for us, that He has done everything He possibly can for us, and that He… Yes? He died in order to take all our sins away, that we could have all those things that we have done wrong forgiven and never remembered anymore. So, today, yes, what were you going to say? That's right, he did indeed. Well, I hope that the message of the balloons will remind us what Jesus has done for us that we remember on this Ascension Sunday. He came to be with us, but as you kept saying as you came back through the door, goodbye, goodbye. That's what Jesus said to His disciples, goodbye. But remember, He said also, I'm going to come again. Now we're going to sing our next hymn. Thank you.
The Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 47, starting at verse 1. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy, for the Lord, the Most High, is terrible, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us, and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For the God, for the God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is from Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. Hear the word of God. 
Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, <clears throat> in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they were upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Ophelius, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. <clears throat> they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is the word of God for the people of God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I must say that was quite an animated children's address, so thank you for that. Just a few announcements today. Winter Communion is on, on the 4th of June. That's two weeks away. Elders are reminded that your elders' bags are in the vestry and session will meet on the 31st of May, Wednesday the 31st of May. Messy Church is on this Thursday, the 25th of May. And Girls' Brigade are still looking for people who would like to do some exercise and would like to help delivering their flyers. The notices there are in the bulletin. Next week, we'll have a confirmation service for the confirmation of Josh Dunn. So that'll be an exciting day for us next week. Next week is also Pentecost Sunday, so please wear something red to signify the flames of the Pentecost. And lastly, Sunday the 11th of June, there'll be a service to mark the coronation of the new king. Thank you.
teachers often get exasperated with the response they get from the students in their class. It's no wonder when students refuse to listen to the lesson, when they don't concentrate or make little effort to understand basic, simple information. In my philosophy class at the New University of Ulster, Professor Harold Nicoll used to tell us students that if our answers to the exam questions he set were a true reflection of the knowledge he had imparted to us, then he had every reason to feel very humble. Students can test a teacher's patience to the limit when they ask stupid questions which reveal how little they have taken in. Teachers have to repeat themselves in the hope that their students eventually learn the lesson. You can imagine how exasperated Jesus was with His disciples when, after all the lessons He had taught them, they still didn't understand. Jesus taught a course between the resurrection and the ascension. The subjects He taught were the kingdom of God and the Spirit of God. The disciples asked a question which showed up their total lack of understanding. Acts chapter 1, verse 6b, Lord, are You at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In His classes, Jesus taught the disciples that the Holy Spirit was about to come. They thought Jesus was implying that the kingdom was also about to come. The poor old disciples, not being the brightest of students, got very confused because they misunderstood both the nature of the kingdom and the relation between the kingdom and the Holy Spirit. Jesus' patience was tested to the limit with such a silly question. Lord, are You at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The disciples hadn't been taking in anything that Jesus had been teaching them. When would they ever learn? Lord, are You at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The verb, noun and adverb in the disciples' question reveal their confusion about God's kingdom. The verb restore shows that they were expecting a political and territorial kingdom. The noun Israel shows that they were expecting a national kingdom and the adverbial clause at this time shows that they were expecting its immediate establishment. Jesus gave the disciples an extra lesson about the kingdom to correct their mistaken notion about its nature, extent, and arrival. And so, he continues in verses 7 and 8, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and to the ends of the earth. In this crash course, Jesus taught His disciples three important facts about God's kingdom. The first is this. It is spiritual in its character. In our English language, a kingdom is usually a territorial sphere which can be located on a map. For example, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. In contrast to this, God's kingdom is not a territorial space or sphere. It cannot be located on a map. This is exactly what the disciples were trying to do. They were trying to take God's kingdom and somehow locate it in a place somewhere in the world where they themselves, hopefully, were dwelling. They were confusing the kingdom of God with the kingdom of Israel. They were still dreaming of political dominion, of the reestablishment of the monarchy, and of Israel's liberation from the colonial yoke of Rome. They had become disillusioned because of the cross, but now their hopes were rekindled by the resurrection. Being a good teacher, Jesus repeats Himself yet again for the benefit of His slow learning students. When will they ever learn? He reverts back to the topic of the Holy Spirit. In His lesson, Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit coming upon them and giving them power to be His witnesses. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you will be My witnesses. In Charles Williams' notable words, Jesus departed scattering promises of power. Jesus' promise that the disciples would receive power was part of His reply to their question about the kingdom. The exercise of power is inherent in the concept of any kingdom. There is a huge difference between God's kingdom and an earthly kingdom. Jesus' reference to the Holy Spirit defines the nature of God's kingdom. It is His rule set up in the lives of His people by the Holy Spirit. John Stott says, it is spread by witnesses, not by soldiers, through a gospel of peace, not a declaration of war, and by the work of the Spirit, not by force of arms, political intrigue, or revolutionary violence. That's God's kingdom. Compare this to Vladimir Putin's concept of a kingdom. By the use of violence, he invades Ukraine in order to take that country over, and no doubt other countries too. That's his concept of an earthly kingdom. How different to God's kingdom. There's a temptation to politicize God's kingdom. For political purposes, people refer to Australia as a Christian country. This implies that we will resist the forces of Islamic influence. 
It's a political concept for many people. Northern Ireland, my native country, is often referred to as the province of Ulster. The Reverend Ian Paisley, who was a fundamentalist preacher and politician, often used the phrase, for God and Ulster. It implied that God was on the side of the British and not on the side of the Irish. This reduces God's kingdom to a territory, a piece of turf, and identifies it with a national flag. God's kingdom must never be identified with a political ideology. Some people go to the other extreme and over-spiritualize God's kingdom as if God's rule operates only in heaven and not on earth. They take no interest in politics, and in Australia they only vote because it is compulsory to do so. I knew Christians in Northern Ireland who refused to vote, where of course voting is not compulsory. They belonged to conservative Christian groups that were isolated from the community. They played no part in public life. While God's kingdom is primarily spiritual in its character, it does have political and social implications in any nation. The values of God's kingdom collide with the secular values of worldly kingdoms. But notice, secondly, it is international in its membership. Despite being in Jesus' class, the disciples still cherished narrow nationalistic aspirations. By asking Jesus if He was about to restore to Israel her national independence, the disciples showed that they had not been listening to one word Jesus said. Jesus gave an answer to their silly question that broadened their horizons. He promised that the Holy Spirit would empower them to be His witnesses. You shall be My witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They would begin in Jerusalem, the national capital, where Jesus had been condemned and crucified. They would continue in the immediate area of Judea. Christian mission would then radiate out from that center, first to despise Samaria, and then far beyond Palestine to the Gentile nations, and then to the very ends of the earth. Just before the ascension, Jesus gave His disciples a mandate to go, go into all the world and make disciples. The book of Acts is a story of missionary activity. This has been going on now for over 2,000 years and is still going on to this day. Christ rules over His church on earth, which is an international community in which race, nation, rank, color, creed, and sex are no barriers to fellowship. One day, when Christ's kingdom is finally consummated, the countless number of people will include, and I love the, these words in Revelation 7 verse 9b, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation tribe, people, and language. How wonderful is that prospect? But notice thirdly, 
that this kingdom that Jesus is talking about is gradual in its expansion. The disciples' question refers to a specific time, verse 6. The New, New English Bible puts it this way, <clears throat> Lord, is this the time when you are going to establish once again the sovereignty of Israel? They asked Jesus if He would do now, after His resurrection, what they had hoped He would do during His lifetime, and would He do it immediately? Instead of giving them dates and times to satisfy their curiosity, Jesus promised them that they would receive power so that between the Holy Spirit's coming and Jesus Christ's second coming, they were to be His witnesses in ever-widening circles. The interim period between Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the parousia, the coming of Jesus back to this world again, is to be marked by worldwide missionary expansion of the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. The church is to announce what Christ achieved at His first coming and to summon people to repent and believe in preparation for His second coming. And so we read in verse 9b, in fact, I haven't got the verse in front of me, I do apologize. Leslie Newbigin, in his book, The Household of God, writes this. This is a very important comment. The church is the pilgrim people of God. It is on the move, hastening to the ends of the earth to beseech all people to be reconciled to God, and hastening to the end of time to meet its Lord, who will gather all into one. It cannot be understood rightly except in a perspective which is at once missionary and eschatological. Very powerful words indeed by Leslie Newbigin. Lord, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? A very silly question, but it gave Jesus the opportunity to explain to them for yet another time what God's kingdom was really all about. The lesson that we need to learn on this Sunday after the ascension is that Jesus has gone up to heaven as we reminded the boys and girls with the, the graphic illustration of the balloons going up into the sky. So, Jesus has left this world. He left the disciples. He's gone up to heaven. And we, we in our church here on earth, we have been sent out to gradually expand God's kingdom through missionary activity. Yesterday morning, I attended a prayer breakfast for SIM Missionary Society down at Hughes Baptist Church. It was incredible to hear about what God is doing through that missionary society in many parts of the world, sending out missionaries here in Canberra, from Canberra to other places such as Benin, for example. 
We here at St. Andrews, we are involved in this task by raising money to support missionary activity. We support missionary families. For example, we support the Roe family in Tasmania who are working with fusion. What a great work that is. I had the privilege of seeing it just a couple of years ago on a visit. And that work is going on from strength to strength, all helped by the money that we raise here in our church to support that family and other families as well. That's why we have our fundraising dinners, to raise funds to support our missionaries overseas. And I trust that St. Andrews will always be a missionary-centered church, because if it's not, then we are not serving our purpose, and we are not fulfilling God's call to us to extend His kingdom in the world. When will we ever learn? Well, that was certainly true for the disciples, and maybe it's true for us too. What a silly question. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They had missed the point. I hope we haven't. But just in case we have, let me underline again that the kingdom of God is spiritual in its character, international in its membership, and gradual in its expansion. When will we learn? Unlike the disciples, may we learn this lesson today. Amen. God of power and might, we have received so much from your hand. We lift up before you now the fruit of our work expressed through these gifts of money. Grant that your kingdom that we have talked about today will indeed be extended to the uttermost parts of the earth. This we pray in the name of the one who ascended to heaven, that we might have fullness of life here on earth. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, ruler of all, servant of all, we pray for the kingdoms and rulers of this world, that those in positions of authority may use their power in the service of their people and for the good of all. 
We pray for those who take counsel together on behalf of nations, all who carry the responsibility of leadership. Grant them wisdom in all their decisions, humility to listen to the point of view of others, courage to stand up for what is right, and a determination to work for justice and peace. We pray for Ukraine and Sudan, among other nations in the world, where conflict and war continue relentlessly. Grant that in these countries, peace and stability will come. Servant King, may your love reign supreme. Lord, we pray for our own country of Australia, which is wrestling with a number of complex and potentially divisive issues at the present time, many of which will require all of us to be involved in making huge decisions before the end of this current year. We pray for our government, now one year old, and for the members of Parliament, both in the lower house and in the Senate, giving thanks for the dedicated service they give. So often they are criticized for their decisions, and yet without them, we would not be able to have the democratic system that we enjoy. Guide them in their debates in this coming week as they pass legislation and give them a proper sense of the responsibility entrusted to them. Help them to work not just for personal or party interest, but for the good of all people in their electorates and in the country as a whole. Be with Ian Biggs, a member of our congregation, who has just begun a new diplomatic posting as Australian ambassador in Vienna. Guide Ian in all his new and demanding responsibilities, and also be with Christine as she supports Ian in his role. Servant King, may your reign, may your love reign supreme. Lord, we pray for our Governor-General, David Hurley, for the members of the royal family, and especially our new King, King Charles III. We give thanks for his recent coronation, that in the magnificent service of worship at Westminster Abbey, your name was highly exalted. We pray for our new King, that he will be dedicated to duty and committed to the nations in the Commonwealth, including Australia, throughout his reign. Grant to, him, <clears throat> grant to him at all times your guidance, discernment, strength, and inspiration. Servant King, may your love reign supreme. Lord, we pray for all who strive to build a fairer society and a better world, those who campaign against poverty, injustice, and exploitation, who work for peace and reconciliation, who offer healing to body, mind, and spirit, and those who serve the needy. Encourage them in their work, support them in adversity, provide the resources they need and make known your love through their ministry. Comfort those who mourn the loss of loved ones in the fire in a hostel in Wellington, New Zealand. Lay your healing touch upon the children seriously injured in recent road accidents in Queensland and Victoria. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that 
your kingdom may come. Despite everything that seems to fight against it, a kingdom in which the first are last, and the last first, in which everything that frustrates your purpose and denies your love is defeated, and in which people live together in justice and harmony. Servant King, may your love reign supreme. We ask all these things for your dear name's sake, the one who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ our King, make you faithful and strong to do His will, and bring you to reign with Him in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.